Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 137 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is The Dynamic Duo, an interview with Olivia and Holiday Goodrow. My name is Richard Johannesson. And I'm Matt Sabatello. So, Matt, we named this episode The Dynamic Duo as an homage to uh, Batman and Robin because these two women are an unbelievable pair who are doing so much good for the Lyme disease community. And what I found most powerful about this interview as a parent is that Holiday Goodrow would not take no for an answer from any one of 51 doctors she took her daughter to over the course of 18 months. But even more powerful, after Olivia got her Lyme disease diagnosis, Holiday wanted to make sure that Olivia would be treated by the very best doctors. And she volunteered to drive Dr. Richard Horowitz from an airport to a Lyme disease conference. And that ultimately allowed them to connect with Dr. Horowitz who became Olivia's treating physician. So Rich, it has to run in the family because there's no other way to describe Olivia than a superhero. She's 16 today, got sick at seven, and she so showed nothing but strength and perseverance throughout her journey. She started the Tick Tracker Company, which is the first app that helps users report and track ticks in real time to prevent Lyme disease. She also started the Live Lyme Foundation, which is a foundation that helps raise money for Lyme treatment for kids and also helps raise money to find a cure for Lyme disease. She also ran a Lyme Gala, that featured Dr. Horowitz and raised a lot of money for the Lyme community. She's also met with and advocated with many of the top Lyme doctors in the country. And she's also helped implement a lot of Lyme legislation throughout the country. And it was so amazing to see how sick Olivia was at her worst and to see her on the podcast and how healthy and energetic she was today. It was a real transformation. Matt, it's often said that you know someone based on the fruit of their efforts. And these two women have done some unbelievable work. They've actually paid for the care of almost 50 people who would not have gotten Lyme disease care, but for the work of their foundation. They've also issued four research grants to top scientists at universities like Stanford University, Johns Hopkins University, and the University of New Haven. Matt, I am so excited to introduce these wonderfully dynamic women to the Tick Bootcamp community, Olivia and Holiday Goodrum. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. We're really blessed to have you. And uh, as you know, from our uh, earlier conversation, we're big fans of your family. And we really thank both of you for the contributions you make to the Lyme community. Uh, when I was going on my journey, when Matt has been going on his journey, and we were looking for people who were contributing to the community, we couldn't find anyone more than your family contributing to this community. So I just want to begin our podcast by thanking you and blessing us all with all the good work that your family's contributed to this community. So um, Holly, talk to us about your background and uh, where you're from, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your family, including this wonderful young lady uh, that you have sitting with you. Um, well, thank you for having us, and thank you for the kind words. Um, so I was born and raised in Denver, Colorado, and um, I went to school in New York City and then also in Southern California, and I met my husband in Southern California, and then we moved back to Denver to raise um, our children. And we have three kids, um, Olivia, who, uh, as you know, is 16 years old. And then I have twin boys, Jack and Will, who are 13. Um, and, you know, I, my background was um, I went to school and then I met my husband and then I became a mom. And so um, that was my most important job is becoming a mom and taking care of three kids. Um, having twins, you know, twin boys uh, was a lot too, kind of a surprise. And um, I was just being a mom and um, doing stuff in the community of giving back. Um, I helped different nonprofits and I helped at their schools. Um, and that was kind of what I did. Um, and my whole goal was to get all three kids at school full time all day. And then I was going to like rest for a little. Um, and and well, but moms never rest. <laughs> exactly. Um, and do that sort of stuff. And then, um, unfortunately, uh, Olivia got bit by a tick um, at the beginning, right before her uh, second grade year. And so that kind of, um, as we say, just blew up the plans of, of just having a normal life to where I was going to be a soccer mom and hang out and do all that. And it really started us down this journey of trying to get my daughter well um and and going through um a journey that 
you know, you wish on no one because um, it's really hard and, and you feel alone and lost and nobody believes you that you have a daughter who's sick. Meanwhile, you know, she's getting sicker and sicker by the day. So that, um, that was kind of my, my background before, you know, we had a, a tick that bit Olivia. So Olivia, talk to us about what you remember about your life prior to your tick bite. What was life like? I remember being a very active and lively kid. Um, I played soccer and my dad was the coach of the team and I had a bunch of friends ranging from all of like the different friend groups that you would find at a school. And I remember I loved to run so much. And I also very vividly remember that I loved dogs with all of my heart to where I had finally just convinced my mom to get a dog. But the catch was it had to live at my grandma's house. So I remember being like, I want to be a vet. I want to have an animal sanctuary. I want to do these things. Um, and I was just a really energetic kid for my age. So let's talk about uh, Colorado and ticks in Colorado. See, I, I grew up on Long Island and we were always aware of ticks because it was a big part of our lives. And my mother was very, very tick conscious. Uh, talk to us, Holiday, about what you knew about ticks and tick diseases before your daughter suffered her tick bite. I knew a big fat nothing about any of them, except I knew that you were supposed to like burn it out if you found it on you. I mean, it's like the old school way of everything. And I just thought it was an East Coast problem. I didn't even know how to spell Lyme disease correctly. I mean, I knew nothing about it. Now, that being said, there are ticks. I mean, as we know, there are ticks everywhere in every state. So Olivia wasn't bit here. She was bit, we were on vacation um, in Missouri where she was bit. And I did not know that there were ticks there because had I known, obviously as a parent, you would protect your kid and be looking for ticks. So I, I knew nothing, nothing about ticks except you were supposed to burn it out, which you're not supposed to do. So that's all I knew. Right. So so you shared with us your goal was to be the best mom in the world. You wanted to make sure that you had three really healthy, safe, happy children, and you were dedicating your life and your career to making that happen. Now, of course, if you were aware of ticks and tick diseases, I'm positive a mom like you would have taken all the precautions she could have taken to make sure that her daughter did not have come in contact with ticks. Am I right about that? You are very correct. And I actually know the night that Olivia was um, bit, and I have to say, it's one of those things I replay in my head over and over again, like, what if? What if we wouldn't have gone out looking for fireflies? You know, what if we just stayed in and read a book? You know, what if, what if, what if? And it's like, I would have never have taken her out there had I known that there were ticks in the woods. So talk to us about that experience. What was the tick bite experience like? And what did you do when you discovered the tick on Olivia? So we never saw the tick and she never had a rash, but I know the night that it happened. So we were in Missouri at the Lake of the Ozarks and my boys were three and a half, you know, and three and a half boy twins is a lot. Um, and Olivia kind of got a little sidelines, you know, with the boys and especially around water. I was making sure that they were safe and not drowning, even though they were life preservers. Um, and so I put the boys to bed and we put the boys to bed. And then that was kind of our Olivia time with her just to do stuff. And since we were from Colorado and didn't have fireflies, um, I thought it'd be fun for us to go um, walk around this driveway. And there was like forest in the middle of this driveway and on either sides. And obviously not go in the forest because I was more worried about poison ivy. Um, and so I was like, let's just stay on the edge of the forest and go see if we could catch some fireflies. And so Olivia and I went out, we had like an amazing mom daughter time. We got a jar, we went and caught fireflies. Olivia had never seen fireflies. It was so fun. You know, we brought it up, but my whole thing was like, don't go into the forest because there's poison ivy. You know, and so I know that she was just walking along the forest and now knowing about ticks, you know, a tick was probably on a leaf of grass, something down low and attached 
to probably her leg, her ankle, her foot, wherever it was. And, and so we had, we had a great evening. It was so sweet. I kind of like went in that night and I was like, oh my gosh, what an amazing night. And looking back, it was like the worst night of our lives that changed it our lives forever and Olivia's life forever and her childhood forever. And so um, it's something that will pain me the rest of my life. And when I see fireflies now, like my heart just breaks a little. So Olivia, what do you remember about that trip to Missouri and the experience your mom just shared with us about uh, you and she hunting for fireflies? So the Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri is absolutely my favorite place to be on this planet. A lot of people are like, I like Hawaii or I like Greece and I like the middle of the country in this little lake. Um, and so every trip that I've gone down there, our family, we go down there every single year. And we've been doing this since my grandma was nine years old. So it's a really big family tradition for us. And um, every single trip is just amazing. Um, we go enter tubing, we drive a boat, we have a jet ski, we swim a lot, we fish. Um, I mean, there's this little um, kind of raft called a zip sled. And basically it's like a yellow plastic sled and it has like a rope coming out of the top of it. And so that was kind of like my first ever set of like water skis to where I kind of like kind of learned the ropes of that a little bit and it's always just an amazing time there. I mean, there's a pirate themed restaurant that has like a working pirate ship. It's just a really fun place to be as a kid and even now. And so that experience of me catching fireflies, I, that, that was such an amazing experience. For me. And it was just, at the time it was incredible and I had such a fun time and I love my brothers with all of my heart. But when they were three years old, yes, they were a handful. They were very sweet, but they were also a handful. And so this was like finally a little bit of like a break from like having to make sure that they're safe around the water because they were asleep. And we just had an amazing time. We caught fireflies. I think we even caught a frog. Um, and it was just incredible in general and um you know getting bitten by a tick and having Lyme disease that didn't stop me from going back to the Lake of the Ozarks it hasn't ever and I feel like the reason why it hasn't is because now I'm like a more educated person where ticks are like in the forest they're going to be where plants are so now I'm just like okay stay in the middle of the pavement the water's your friend the dock is fine. I'm not bothered by just staying on the boat. Like the house is great. So I think that because I was more educated and also because in, and also because um in truth that I got Lyme disease, it makes that place more special to me almost. Like I have a greater connection to that place now. We're gonna talk about all of the lessons that you've learned so that we can pass those on to other folks so they don't have to go on the journey that you've gone on. But we're going to ask you to hold on to that for a little bit longer because I want to go back to Holiday. So Holiday, talk to us about how you know that this beautiful experience that you had with your daughter at the lake is the time when she did contract her Lyme disease. Um, well, because that was the only time we were ever near the woods or something green to where there are ticks there. So I knew that was like the night. Um, but what happened, and, and then we left, I think the day or two later, we left to come back to Denver. And then, you know, Olivia was a classic Lyme case, tick-borne disease case, because she started getting sick about six weeks later. Um, and it was right when school has started um, for second grade. And so we were kind of like, huh, you know, school just started, you know, is there, you know, a virus going around, you know, maybe she's got the flu, maybe she's got strep. I mean, it was just, you could see she was getting sick. Um, you could physically see it. I mean, she was gray as a ghost. I mean, I'd have moms at pickup being like, what is wrong with Olivia? And I'd be like, I don't know, we, we can't figure it out. You know, we went and 
did all the normal, go to your pediatrician and be like, this kid is sick. And she just started progressively getting worse. Um, and her second grade teacher, who we just adore and are still very close to, Cindy Cheadle, um, you know, she called us in in October. So this was August when we were on vacation and we started noticing the end of September that she was getting sick. And then October is like the first parent conference and she called us in and she was like, something is wrong with Olivia. And she's like, I've been teaching for, you know, decades and it has nothing to do educationally wise. Like there's something physically wrong with her. And we're like, we know, we don't know what it is. We keep on going to doctors and, and our pediatrician and they're like, you know, here it is, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. We saw an allergist who's like, oh, she needs her adenoids out. So we had her adenoids taken out. I mean, it was just one of those things, but you could see this as Olivia described herself, a very energetic, very sporty kid. You know, she's the firstborn, she's a rule follower. She was very athletic. You just saw her deteriorating in front of our eyes. And it was, it was very scary. So Olivia, before I ask you what it was like from your perspective, I want to go back to something you had just said that the place where you had contracted Lyme is very special to you. And that's sort of different than many other people we've interviewed because when they think back to the place and time they got bit and contracted Lyme, it creates anxiety and senses of trauma and sort of PTSD. So I think that says something about you and your mindset and how you've been able to accept and come to terms with Lyme and, and, and healing from Lyme. So can you talk to us about why that place is a special place for you, even though it's the place that made you so sick? That place was special to me to begin with. And I knew that, especially as a kid, I wasn't going to let that one event change the course of how I thought about that place as a whole. And I feel like you can kind of put that statement on a bunch of things. For example, um, my brother, broke his leg at a mini golf course and yet we went back there for a few years afterwards it didn't change his fear over that it just kind of taught him a lesson maybe not to go trip over the structure um and so i feel like you can kind of apply that to a lot of situations whether it be personal or kind of as a group um and just because something bad happens doesn't mean that the whole place is now all of a sudden bad um, every time I go back there, I just look at the woods and I'm like, yeah, it happened. I don't go back there anymore. So Olivia, you're not going to allow Lyme to own you. You're going to own Lyme. And it's not going to ruin your family's, this multi-generational special place for your family. Yeah, exactly. And I learned my lesson and now I am more educated about the situation. And so I won't be going into the woods anymore. But in reality, it was such a rare occurrence. As my mom said, it was like our first and last time doing that because we had always been out on the water. So it wasn't, the woods itself wasn't such a really big part for me. It was beautiful. It was right across the street. It was right around our driveway in our house. But as a kid, I was like, yes, I want to go enter tubing. I want to do this. I want to go swimming. Um, let's go to the pirate restaurant, like things like that to where I feel like had it been like, I don't know, some kind of like fish like biting me in the water, I feel like I would have been much more terrified um, because I had a stronger connection to that. Um, but yeah, I'm not letting Lyme disease control my opinions on such an amazing place. Well, and I think also to add to Olivia's is that, um, once we did figure out what was going on and, and we were messing with her medication, we'd always mess with it in the summer so that hopefully she wouldn't miss school. And so we do it down at the lake so that she could just sleep and rest and deal with the side effects of all the drugs that she was on. So it was also a time for sort of Olivia to um, just sort of uh, relax, recharge, and deal with um, all the drugs that we were doing different drug cocktails with her to try and get her better. Well, Holiday, I think what matters is focusing on here is, is mindset. And unfortunately, many of the young people that we talk to and many of the people that we've interviewed on our podcast, unfortunately have found themselves frozen because their mindset does not allow them to move forward. It's very difficult to take action on a plan 
if you're not emotionally prepared to do that. And what's wonderful, it's really powerful already at this stage in the podcast is we're seeing a very young woman um, have a very powerful mindset that's allowing her to heal. And that's an important thing that we do want to emphasize at this point in the, in the conversation that uh, this, this very powerful mindset that Olivia has had is allowing her to be successful in her healing journey. Yes, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that um, Olivia's whole, one of her whole goals is to not let, you know, tick-borne diseases take over her life. And I think a way that she has been able to deal with it is like, okay, let's go do something about it. Let's go fix it. Let's go help people. Let's do this, you know? And so she's really, I think, put an emphasis on helping other people. And I think in the long run, that's helped her. So Olivia, let's go back to now when you first got sick. I know you were seven and you may not remember a lot, but what do you remember about your declining health after that, that trip? Um, I remember uh, I had a tremor in my right hand. I couldn't physically hold up my head at times to where like my head just felt like so heavy and I felt so tired that I would rest my head on the desk. Um, I felt so sore all over. Um, whether it be cramping or bruising or muscle aches, things like that. Um, I vividly remember the first time that I lost my vision due to Lyme disease. And so this was in the second grade and we had um, this little like line for like snack. And so there were like, I think four tables and I was at the last one. And so the teacher who ultimately saved my life, she was calling on the tables and mine was last and I didn't get up. I couldn't see and I could hear and I could feel, but I couldn't see. And so I was terrified that if I got up, I was going to fall and like maybe embarrass myself or hurt myself or hurt someone else. And so I just stood there and I was silent and I was terrified. And so she called me again and I didn't say anything back since I didn't really know what to do. And then she tapped my shoulder and kind of shook it. And that seemed to help um, with the vision loss to where I was like gaining it back. And that really scarred me in general. And it would happen a few times after that. And I feel like out of all of my symptoms that I had, that was probably the most terrifying one to deal with. So Holiday, you have this beautiful little kid who's very active and you come back from vacation and now you start to see these changes. What is your reaction as a resourceful mom? Well, my reaction is my kid is sick and I got to figure out what's wrong with her. Um, and so that started this, you know, insane journey of going from doctor to doctor who they'd be like, oh, can't figure it out. Nothing's wrong. Maybe she's making it up. Maybe she needs to drink more water. You know, I mean, it was just insane. Um, but the whole time she is getting really sick. Um, she physically looks sick. She physically was really trying hard. Like she couldn't get out of bed. Um, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, does she have a brain tumor? Does she have cancer? You know, I was like, is there late stage autism? I mean, it was getting, she couldn't, she stopped tracking us when we were, when we'd walk in the room. Um, she was having light sensitivity, um, you know, and I, I would have friends coming over moms and they'd be like, what is going on with Olivia? You know, um, the school would call me constantly being like, you know, Olivia can't lift up her head. And so we're letting her lay on the floor to do her math. And I was like, what? And, and they'd be like, you, you have to figure this out. Something is wrong with your child. Um, and so this started the odyssey of us going from doctor to doctor. And her pediatrician was a family friend of ours. Um, but there were, there were times where I would literally want to throw my cell phone across the room because he would be like, well, we went here and nothing's wrong. And then you went there and nothing's wrong. And you know, do you think maybe she's looking for attention? And I'd be like, looking for attention? I go, this second grader has a tremor in her right hand that she cannot control. And to this day, you will see Olivia hold her right hand. Even though she doesn't have a tremor, you'll just see her hold it. Because I think she didn't want people to see that her, 
her hand was shaking. Um, and so, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I would just sit in my car all by myself and cry my eyes out. I mean, cry and be like, what, you know, what do I do? Um, her nurse at her, her school became a very good friend because she ended up stop calling. She would text me because that's how many times, you know, we were dealing with Olivia and Olivia, you know, she didn't want attention brought to her. She didn't want to be pulled from class. Um, but it was getting really bad. And, um, the time it got super bad, uh, was it was her, it was in the spring of her second grade year. We still were not knowing what was going on with her. And, um, there was the second grade concert, a singing concert. And Olivia was one of the tallest kids at the time in her grade. So she was like on the top row. And, um, I remember just vividly my husband and I in the audience with all the other parents, you know, it's dark in the audience and all the kids are, are uh, singing and all of a sudden I can see Olivia start swaying. And I thought, oh my God, here we go. She's going to um, have one of her blackouts. And she had probably had uh, probably four or five by that point. Um, and I look over at her second grade teacher who also saw what was going on and so did her music teacher. and. Um, cause I thought, oh my God, if she blacks out in front of the entire grade, she's going to be mortified. Um, uh, but I also don't want her falling and hurting herself. So I'm thinking like, do I need to rush the stage and like go get her? But, uh, the music teacher, he saw what was going on too. And all the teachers were aware of her blacking out. So he just walked up, grabbed her hand, brought her down to the floor and just like, put his arm around her. And so I think everyone thought she was gonna have a solo um, in the music, in, in the concert. And he just sat next to her and her, her second grade teacher looked at, like gave me a look like, we got it, we're holding on to her, she's okay. And I just sat in the concert sobbing, quietly sobbing. And as soon as it was over, we went and got her and everyone's like, oh, was Olivia supposed to have a solo, but got too nervous. And I'm thinking if people only knew what was going on and we literally got her in the car, I called the pediatrician and they're like, that's it. She has to go to the hospital. And she ended up being in the hospital for 10 days after that. So Olivia, many people that have experiences like this from Lyme don't remember them either because it's trauma or just the impact of the disease. Do you remember this event that your mom is describing and almost fainting at this, this school event? I do remember that, but um, I guess to like fully answer your question, I also have times where I can't exactly remember what happened in uh, my whole Lyme journey. Um, I remember that like um, the things that I could remember about like these certain times was that I was in pain and I didn't know what was going on but I couldn't remember what kind of pain it was, or maybe it was the opposite to where I knew that like something was wrong, but I didn't know that if I was in pain. And so with that specific event, I do vividly remember that, but with others, I kind of have to piece it back together again. So Holiday, um, Dr. Brian Fallon did some research at Columbia University that came to the conclusion that the average parent must find seven different doctors before their child is diagnosed with Lyme disease. My understanding is you needed 51 doctors over two years before your daughter was diagnosed. So can you share with us what caused you to go from doctor to doctor on what we call the doctor carousel and how did you finally find the doctor that would diagnose Olivia? Well, I went to, from doctor to doctor because my kid was sick. And so if this doctor was not going to do it, I had to go someplace else. I mean, she was so sick um, that, I, I mean, we weren't going to stop until we could figure out what was wrong with her. So um, it took us 51, 51 doctors in 18 months for her to be correctly diagnosed with Lyme disease. But it would take another um, four more doctors and three more years for her to then be correctly diagnosed with Lyme disease, Bartonella, Babesia, relapsing fever, POTS syndrome, and an anti-1-trypsin deficiency in her liver, all from a tick we never saw and she never had a rash. So um, with that, I, I think it's just what moms 
And, and parents do. If you have a kid that is struggling, you want to figure out what is going on. Um, so the- well, But did you have a doubt? Did you have a doubt whether she was physically sick or whether she was suffering from some kind of a psychiatric or psychological illness? Never, never. Because it was so physical um, and all she wanted to do was get well and all she wanted to do was be a kid and all she wanted to do is get back on the soccer field, go play with her friends, go to a birthday party. Um, she so would, you, you had 50 doctors tell you there's nothing wrong with this kid or certainly he didn't diagnose with Lyme disease. So how did you have the fortitude to say to each one of these highly trained professional medical experts, you're wrong, she's sick, peace, I'm going somewhere else? Well, there might have been some expletives, too, as I'm leaving the doctor's office a couple of times, because here's the thing. I knew in my gut she was super sick, and I just thought, we got to figure this out. And, and I literally was like, you know, should I go get my medical degree? There were days where I was like, maybe I need to go to med school because this kid is sick. And I just, and also I felt like the arrogance of some of these doctors to not be able to say, I don't know, um, when they didn't know. Um, and so, um, including her pediatrician, who's a good friend of ours. I mean, he really made me incredibly angry on many occasions. Um, the last one was he, he was like, do you, do you think you're, do you think Olivia is making this up? And do you think you're doing this for attention? And I thought I'm doing this for attention. I'm trying to get my kid well here. The last thing I want to do is be calling her to all these doctor's appointments, having her, you know, she had so many procedures that she did not need, which still just like makes my head want to pop off. You know, she had spinal taps she didn't need. She had a liver biopsy um, over spring break of her second grade year that she did not need. Um, and she had to be put under for it. You know, she had so many, you know, scopes and procedures and MRIs and CAT scans and, I mean, blood draws. I mean, so many things that she did not need that had a competent doctor just done a, a Lyme test and even a Western blot of all things. She was off the charts for it. And instead, we put this second grader who is suffering through so many procedures and so many things that were not needed. Um, you know, obviously, you can tell my voice still really, excuse my French, pisses me off. So, so you know, she was misdiagnosed with Wilson's disease um, at the Children's Hospital here. I knew nothing about Wilson's disease. I looked it up. They said she'd be dead by the age of 40. She could not have kids. Um, and that, um, you know, me being now this mom doing research, I researched the heck out of Wilson's disease and I found the top Wilson's disease clinic at University of Michigan. Well, it just happens that Olivia's best friend, grandma was the president of University of Michigan. So I already had lined up to have Olivia go to this Wilson's clinic at University of Michigan and be treated until she died at the age of 40. Now, the only way we would know if, if she did or didn't for sure have Wilson's disease is if we did a DNA test out of pocket for $6,000. Well, I turned to my husband, I was like, we have to do this. So we did a DNA test. Um, it took like six weeks. It was over spring break of her second grade year. And I sat at spring break and I cried my eyes out almost every day because I thought I can't have her die at 40. I can't have her die at 40. And it was supposed to be hereditary to where my boys would get it too. And all my kids would be dead by the age of 40. Um, and I just turned to my husband. I was like, this can't be it. I just don't, I just don't believe it. So sure enough, the DNA test came back. She, she does not have Wilson's, which thank goodness, it's a horrible disease. And they more or less said, we don't know what it is. And we think you guys are probably making it up. And that's how we left the children's hospital. So Olivia, we found in almost 150 guests that we've interviewed on our podcast that the ones that are the most successful in their healing journeys are those that have a supportive family and social group, which you clearly have with your mother and your family. But the other half of that is to be able to take some responsibility on yourself to, to have the right mindset and to move forward in your healing journey and to take on some of it on your own. And I think you definitely have that as well. So what was this like from your standpoint 
when your mother was fighting for you and you're going to all these doctors, I mean, 51 different doctors as a seven-year-old, what do you remember during this time? Um, I remember, um, I remember like random things. I couldn't tell you, I feel like every single thing that happened there, um, just because I was a little kid and I didn't understand a lot of the things that were going on. I mean, when I was told that I had Wilson's disease, I was thinking of a boy in my class whose name was also Wilson. And I was like, is this another form of like cooties or something? Like what's going on? And so I just, I think that having a really supportive family helped me. And I feel like everyone who's suffering from tick-borne diseases should have some form of support, whether it's like a therapist or a really good friend or like talking to people about it. Um, and so, the things that I remember um, in this like hospital experience was I was there long enough to know how to work the TV remote. Um, I remember that the head, the headmaster of our middle school gave me a little like stuffed like toucan neck pillow thing. I think I have it somewhere. Um, I remember all of these cards coming in one day for my class that had um they were all blue and they all had dogs on them those were my two favorite things back then i mean they still are but um and so that just made my day um i remember that this is really random but i remember um the baked beans at the hospital were by far the best thing that you could get on the menu so i, I recommend it to anybody who might be going there soon um and then i remember the bad things i remember doing mris and cat scans and at the children's hospital, I can't, it was some x-ray machine, but you could like tilt your head all the way back and there would be a movie playing upside down. And I remember it was the sequel to Tarzan that was playing. And um, I remember holding a little stuffed black dog. Her name is Maxine and I still have her because um, she was like my support stuffed animal. I remember holding her really tightly as I'm going under and I was able to bring her in since she didn't have like any metal and it was just like plastic and like cotton. And I remember the spinal tap and like having immense pain after that and like my back. Um, I had just gotten a dog and my grandma had come in and she was like, yeah, I was trying to get the dog in here, but I had to be a service animal. And I was thinking of getting a vest to put on the little puppy. Um, I don't think they would have believed it at all. Um, and so I just remember like a lot of smaller details. I feel like I can't, um, like I understand the big picture that I was sick, that I was going through these things. Um, but the small details I remember about it are totally at random. Um, I can't tell you um, how I felt after the liver biopsy, but I can do it with the spinal tap. Um, I can tell you that outside my hospital bedroom, there was a gravel roof below that I looked out to, but I can't tell you um, how I felt after getting a few EKGs and stuff like that. Uh, and I feel like with any almost experience, like you don't remember every single thing, you just remember certain parts of it. And I feel like at that time I couldn't control what I remembered. So when I got my adenoids out, I remember like a red slushy and stuff like that. I think I immediately threw up after that or something like that. Um, and so I think that like having just like in general, that support system really helped me got, get through it in general to where like these things I can now laugh about almost. And instead of kind of bringing me like anxiety or pain, I'm just like, yeah, it happened, but I've gotten over it. It, it passed. So Olivia, there, unfortunately there are many young children and preteens and teens that have Lyme disease and, and suffer through chronic Lyme. So what was this like from your standpoint, dealing with your friends and the change in your health and your relationships with your friends? Um, so I got properly diagnosed in the third grade after having 18 months of me going without any diagnosis, going in and out of doctor's offices. And so it was recommended to me that I 
to tell my class what had happened instead of them finding out some other way. That way the truth can really um, come from me. And so that's what I did. I remember I had a little presentation, a little slideshow, of kind of what happened um, and how I was like doing better. And after that, like everything totally changed. And I feel like some kids were like, okay, whatever. Like I, like, I don't know, I have ADHD, like it's all right. Um, and some kids were really supportive and like didn't care about this disease that I had. And other kids were like the exact opposite to where the moment they heard disease, they were like, oh my goodness, the bubonic plague, we're all going to die. And so over like the course of my middle school experience, um, it was just kind of ups and downs to where I, I absolutely had an amazing support system of friends and they were a very close group of friends that I had. and. I owe them my life basically. Um, but also I lost so many friends um, because of it. I lost um, my god sister who I knew since she was born. And so that was like extremely hard for me. And it's even like hard now because I just had such a strong connection to her and her family in general. And she had come out to the Ozarks. Um, she kind of knew that place also and to have her kind of just slowly drift apart to where we're like strangers again and we only say hi in the hallway like one time a year that was just so miserable and so I wish that on no one. Olivia aside from your social your social cir circle and your friends what impact did your illness have on your family and your brothers Jack and Will and your mom and your dad? Um I feel like we all had to kind of work twice as hard um, and now like for everyone. And I also feel like because I had this disease, my parents all of a sudden switched their attention back onto me and my brothers were now kind of sidelined. And so we like, we didn't forget them, but <laughs> we, did, we didn't forget them. We didn't like exclude them from anything, um, but I feel like my parents were a lot more concerned with my health. Um, and so I feel like that also had like an impact on them um, to kind of like be going from like the parents always like watching over them because they're twins, because um, they're like really active, very energetic. Um, and they were three when I got bitten by a tick. And so they don't remember me not being sick. And so um, they've been really supportive all the time and I love them with all of my heart and I feel like my family is just like such a strong kind of like powerful group um, and I would not trade them for anything else even a cure for Lyme disease. So Holiday let's talk about the impact that uh, this experience has had on the rest of your family. How has this impacted your relationship with your husband? And how has this impacted your relationship with your boys because you were focusing so much over the course of this 18 month window on getting your daughter through the carousel of doctors? Um, well, I think for any family that has dealt with a child having an illness, it's incredibly hard. Um, you know, I think personally, it's probably taken some years off my life um, of just the stress and sadness. Um, I think for my husband and I, you know, we, we joke that we're really good in a crisis. Um, but I think it's been very hard on our relationship because we've had to put everything towards our children. Um, I think it's also been very hard on my husband. Um, you know, he's kind of the rock of the family. And I think for him not to be able to help his daughter and um, fix her, um, I think was very hard on him. And I think to watch him, watch her being sick and he couldn't fix her, um, really, really broke his heart. Um, I think in a bizarre way for the boys, um, thank goodness they're twins and they had each other, um, you know, and they were so supportive of Olivia and they learned at a very young age empathy 
um, they would come home from preschool and Olivia would be in bed and they would come and snuggle with her. So in a bizarre way, they kind of flipped the, you know, the ages of them sort of caring for her. They would get in bed and read books with her, be on the iPad with her and just snuggle. And they, um, they, you know, whether it's good or bad, you know, it is our family, um, they, you know, being twin boys, people always think, oh my gosh, they're so active, they're so this. And I'm like, you know, they're very mellow, good guys because they had a, an older sister who was sick. And so they learned how to, let's just go color with her because she can't be outside running around and playing soccer. You know, let's lay in bed and, um, you know, play on the iPad together and do something like that. So so the boys- um, They're it's apathetic. Funny. I think now, you know, with everything we're doing and all the traveling, they're kind of like, hey, what about us? Why can't we come? But back in the day, you know, they they knew they knew that when Olivia didn't look good, like it we're all gonna be mellow and quiet and just kind of, you know, let her be um, dealing with what she was dealing. So they they have been really wonderful through this whole thing. So Holiday, how did this affect you socially? Uh, when we interviewed Chris Newby, the author of Bitten, she talked about how other moms mistreated her when she wasn't able to, for example, drive uh, children, other children in the community to, um, to activities because she was so sick, she couldn't safely drive them. How did you get treated by other moms and other people in your social circle? Well, um, it's interesting you ask that. Uh, I think I, I dealt with a lot of what Olivia dealt with too. Um, I lost a lot of friends who I think thought we were making this up, uh, milking for attention. Um, I think also, you know, like I, I couldn't go out to a cocktail party because Olivia was homesick. And I think after a while, people kind of stopped asking um, and then I think, uh, I think when then, um, Olivia started the foundation and we started getting some recognition, I think there were moms that were jealous and, um, and I thought, why in the world would you be jealous about this? You know, I, I would trade everything to have my child be well. And one of the things that I thought was so fascinating was that if, if I would have had a friend who was going through this thing, I would have been like, how can I help? What do you need? You know, um, Olivia and I talk about had she had a disease that everyone accepted, like a, a cancer or diabetes or something, you'd have casseroles on your kitchen counter to where here, I still, to this day, get people saying to me, wait, Olivia's still sick. Didn't she go on 28 days of uh, medicine and she should have been fine. Right. And I, I just, you know, I just sit there. So I think socially for us, it, it was very hard. We lost a lot of friends. I think a lot of people were talking behind our backs. Um, and I just thought, wow, why wouldn't you have been like, how can we help? What do you need? You know, and instead, um, to this day, I get people who, I know when I leave the room or like, oh, there's that mom whose daughter supposedly has Lyme disease. You know, and I just think, wow, until you get a tick-borne disease, you really do not understand how awful it is and you would not wish it on anyone. So Olivia, you must have likely remembered this or at least observed some of this happening, although you were still young. What was it like for you and how did you feel watching this happen with your parents from other adults? You know, it kind of like almost was like a reflection of like what was happening to me with like kids at my grade, um, but just aged up almost. And it was like the same parents too, um, to where like I I knew that kid. I knew that their their parents. Um, we had gone to dinner together. Like we were such good friends, and all of a sudden, like ah, oh, there they go, just kind of drifting away. Um, and I feel like my mom was just very strong through all of it. Um, and I feel like we both had to be um, with that um, because some of the friends, like we thought that we were going to go to college together. Like we planned 
uh, what house we would buy in California. Like we planned how many dogs we would have. We named the dogs that we were going to get, um, those things. And so those things just never happened. Um, and we never thought that like we would drift apart. We made promises um, that like we would be at each other's weddings. Um, and to see like that kind of friendship just kind of like drift off is like really heartbreaking. Um, but like also if someone's going to treat you like that, you do have to let go even though it may be really hard for you. Did your diagnosis after the two year window of being sick validate your illness with people in school? Um, almost, I feel like it made it worse in some ways, um, because I feel like in second grade, again, we didn't know much. We didn't really know anything. Um, it was just our, kind of our parents' influence and like our teachers' influence and like TV shows, if we like even watch those things. And so when I was diagnosed, um, I feel like at a young age, kids like the term disease, they're like, oh, something that can spread, something that will affect me too. And so when I told them that, hey, I have Lyme disease, they like didn't register anything else that I said. They were just like, oh, you're sick. Like, why are you here? And so almost not like knowing what happened. Like I, I, I'm very glad that I do know what happened, but that period where I didn't know what was going on, so I couldn't tell anyone anything, um, that um, they didn't really care about that because they were like, oh, she'll be better. She's going to get better. It may be a broken leg. Like, I don't know what they thought, um, but they weren't as like appalled by me having a disease where like they didn't know back then. Um, and so, I feel like they, I don't know, they just, um, they were fine being oblivious to kind of what was going on. And um, they didn't really, again, they still don't exactly know like what's going on with me. They just kind of are like, oh yeah, she's sick. Don't go near her. Don't sit at that table. Um, don't hang out with her anymore. Those things. So Holiday, let's talk about the holiday grip. You went through 50 different doctors before you got a diagnosis. And I'm wondering if now that you have an opportunity to look back at that experience, is there something you may have done differently or you'd recommend to a parent that was, that's in the throes of what you were in the middle of that may have been able to shortcut the number of doctors you would have need, needed to see? That is a great question. Um, I think, what would I have done differently? Um, Well, I feel like maybe what I would have done differently is not believe in the medical community as much as I put my trust in them that they would figure this out, that I think I would have maybe by like the 10th, 12th, 15th, 18th doctor been like, okay, I got to go someplace and figure this out quicker. Um, and I think I... I definitely, one of the things I would still do is trust my gut. My gut was like, you know, I got a sick kid. These people don't know what they're talking about, but it kind of goes against everything you were raised to where doctors know what they're talking about. And I'm like, these people don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, I've got a sick kid here. So, and I think I would have, um, I don't know. It's hard to say because we were looking at so many different diseases of what was, possibly wrong with Olivia that we would check the box off of, okay, now it's not that, now it's not that, now it's not that. Um, I think I would have, how funny, been more aggressive, asked more questions, and maybe have gone to like another state. We were in Colorado doing all this with the 51 doctors, and maybe I should have gone to like one of the coasts um, to be, you know, I don't know. It, it was just one of those things. Interestingly enough, the um, I kept on pressing uh, our pediatrician, you know, you gotta figure this out. We gotta figure this out. Like, where else can we go? What can we do? Who else can we see? 
And um, the woman who did finally test Olivia for Lyme disease, how interesting, was our first woman doctor. We had had all male doctors before. Um, and um, to be quite honest, when we went in there, I was having a really bad attitude because here we go again. And so they're asking the same questions and we've been through this again and again. And so I probably wasn't as polite as I should have been because I was just, I was just, I, I was so tired. Um, the good thing was Olivia was having, now we look at it as a Lyme day, but at the time we didn't know what was going on, but she was super checked out, could barely walk, um, you know, was, was just sort of gone. Um, and so this woman got a witness, Olivia, in this sort of state. Um, and so she said, you know, we're going to do all these tests and you need to go get all this blood work. And here we, you know, it's just the same thing we were going through. Um, and then we got a phone call that was right before the holidays of her third grade year. And we got a phone call after the holidays. Um, and what's fascinating is, you know, on Facebook up comes like pictures of, of, of what was going on eight years ago, 10 years ago. Um, up came a photo of our family seeing Santa. And I look at Olivia and Olivia is so sick. You see this photo and I just saw the other, I just burst out crying. She was so sick. And you look and think, who would not have believed that this kid was sick? I mean, she looked, she was gray. She had, you know, circles under her eyes. I mean, she was so sick. Um, and so when the woman, when this doctor, doctor, uh, her name's Debbie Hamilton, uh, brought us in to, she's like, well, and she, and Olivia again was super sick that day. And she got down to Olivia and she goes, Olivia, I know why you're not feeling good. And I was like, oh, great. You know, what does she have? She needs to drink more water. I mean, that was like the ongoing thing. And she said, you have Lyme disease. And I was like, what? Like, how random? And, and she said, she's going to go on 28 days of doxycycline and she'll be fine. Hold that thought for one second, because we do want to get to the to the diagnosis, but I, I do want to explore a couple of other things with you. Sure. One of the things we've repeatedly seen during the course of this podcast is that uh, women have a longer diagnostic journey than men, and people of color have a longer diagnostic journey than white people. So let's talk about the issue you raised that I don't want to lose, which is you believe that one of the reasons why your daughter's diagnostic journey was as long as it is, is because she's female and I'm assuming because you're a female. So talk to us about that part of this journey and what do you think we could do to shorten the female diagnostic journey? Oh, that is a great question. Um, I think, uh, I think a lot of doctors immediately came in and thought I was like a crazy hyper mom whose daughter, they can't figure it out anything wrong. And so I'm just making this up to get attention for my daughter and Olivia's making it up. Um, Did you think it was more your gender rather than your child's gender that was having this negative impact on the diagnostic experience? I feel like almost a little bit of both. Yeah, I, I feel like both. had it been my dad, who was um, more invested into like, I guess like finding out what was wrong. Um, I feel like they might've listened to him more because I feel like having like, I guess like male kind of gender is like, they're stronger, they're more stoic, like they're a leader, like those kinds of things that you hear. But when a girl, like, I feel like if my dad was like, hey, we got to figure this out. Like if he, said the exact same things as my mom, he would be seeing as like a really good dad, a strong leader, like so independent, like just like incredible. But since I feel like my mom was female, they were like, oh, you know, she's she's a little bossy. Um, like, eh. And so I feel like that kind of dynamic um, would have affected it. And I also feel like um, since I'm, like a, I was like a little girl and I wasn't a little boy. Um, I've heard studies of where like people, um, women with ADHD and like dyslexia, they have a longer diagnosis as well because they can like mask their symptoms more. And I also saw that in myself where I was like, no, 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 I'm fine. I want to go back to school to be with my friends. 
um, to where like I could push through it more. And I'm not saying that guys can't do the same thing. I'm just saying that <laughs> I think that I was able to hide a lot of my symptoms for a very long time until it got unbearable. And you can kind of see that with like a lot of other diseases and illnesses. And just like in general, um, they say that like, oh, girls are dramatic, but really we're not. <laughs> we're really like stoic in these kinds of um, situations. And so I feel like had it been my brother that, or one of my brothers that um, had gotten Lyme disease, I feel like they might've found it faster. Um, not because he's like, I guess like a tough cookie, but more because um, he can say, listen, it hurts here, it hurts there. I don't like this, what's going on? Like, I can't go back to school. Kind of like those kinds of things. Well now, but we have 50 men fail you. And we finally come to a woman and she finally listens and helps you to come to a diagnosis. So is it because men are not listening? And I'm gonna ask this to you first, Holiday. Or is it because a woman had the ability to see through the stoic nature of girls generally and was able to see past the tough stoic approach that the little girl presented when she was before the doctor? So I can't really, you know, who knows with those 50 doctors. I mean, I think some of them were super arrogant, you know, so, you know, and, and truthfully, Olivia's doctor that she has now is a male and he's amazing and listens and is wonderful. So I don't think we can stereotype that. I do feel though. Well, stereotype with after 50 failures. I, I think that's not a stereotype. I, I, I yeah. I do feel though that the 51st doctor who was a female, um, she did take the time and listen and think outside the box of, okay, this little girl has been sick. This is what's going on. What is outside the box we should be looking for? What have, what have people missed? And but, what but Holiday, I'm, I'm asking you, what was different with Dr. Hamilton than everyone else that you saw before. Why was this experience different? And, and with all due respect to the doctor that uh, your daughter's treating with now, he didn't diagnose her. I wanna focus on the diagnostic journey and why a female doctor behaved differently and finally came to the right conclusion after 50 of her colleagues failed. I think uh, she looked at all of her records and saw what tests had not been done um, on Olivia and with her symptoms and everything. And I think um, that she came to the, I mean, she did a lot of tests and she repeated some tests, but one of the tests she did that nobody else had done was a Lyme test. But why did this doctor do a Lyme test when no one else did? And what role did gender play in that process? Um, well, I'm not sure if gender played an extremely significant role in that process. I would say that maybe like that kind of like motherly bond almost to a mother and a child had like a good impact on maybe what she thought where she was like, yeah, the mom clearly sees something like I can get behind this. And also she wasn't a Lyme doctor. So she was shooting in the dark, just like all the doctors before and she got it correct. And so the question is, Olivia, why? You know, I mean, you, you said, so let's focus on this, right? It sounds like she was more willing to listen to your mother. She was more willing to believe your mother. And she was able to look past your tough exterior to get to the point where she could properly diagnose you with your illness. And I'm not sure a man would have done that. I know 50 men didn't. I feel like you might have to ask her yourself since <laughs> she, she's the one who did it. Um, I don't know the exact reasoning behind um, her decision on, yes, let's do a Lyme test. I just feel like she kind of had the same determination as my mom did. And instead of kind of giving up once you couldn't find the one answer, she was like, okay, well, it wasn't this let's try this. I'm not going to pass you off to someone else until like I can get like a clear understanding of what's going on. And so I think a big reason was maybe because she didn't give up and 
she didn't kind of like lose hope that she wouldn't find anything. And I also feel like she could admit to saying like, I don't know. Um, when she did the Lyme test, she wasn't like, here's what it is exactly going to happen. Um, you will be fine after 30 days. She said, you should take this and you should be fine, but we don't really know. So I feel like she was okay with kind of being unsure in her ability to kind of diagnose what was going on compared to like the doctors before to where if they didn't know, they'd be like, okay, next doctor to where she was like, I don't know, but let's try. So one of the reasons why doctors are so arrogant is because they are trained to be cowboys. One of the reasons why doctors are so arrogant is because we respond well as patients to arrogant doctors because we're sick. We want somebody to make us better. And when the, when the man uh, in the white coat rides in on his horse, uh, we want to be made better. So Holiday, talk to us about the arrogance issue that you brought up a couple of times and what role you believed the arrogance of the doctors you were treating with played in the diagnostic failures that your family had to face for 18 months? Well, I think the number one thing that I think the medical community needs to work on as a whole is when you don't know what's wrong with someone, instead of saying, oh, maybe you're making it up or maybe they need to you know, drink more water, is to say, I don't know. And so you need to go find someone who could maybe help you. You know, maybe you go this way, maybe you go that way. Um, I think, uh, you know, when like we went and saw a heart doctor for Olivia, you know, and when her heart came back fine, they're just like, your heart's fine. Don't know what to tell you. Like, you know, we're done. We're done here. We've done what we were supposed to do. And so now you have to go someplace else. So I think my big things to doctors and to be quite honest, um, I now talk to doctors about this is um, if you don't know what's wrong with someone, it's okay to say you don't know, but don't say it's in their head or they need to drink more water or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, you know, let those patients then go and try and find someone else. That's what I would say. So Olivia, how do you remember doctors treating you up until the 51st doctor who actually diagnosed you with Lyme disease? Um, I feel like there were like different kinds of doctors. Uh, some of them were like really nice, like really kid friendly. And were like, okay, we're going to try our, like, we're going to try this. Um, we're going to see if you have this. Um, and some of them like weren't ever like present at all. Like I couldn't remember their faces. They only came in like once. Others blatantly told me are you making this up for attention and th they would do it in like that voice too to where it's like that underestimated kind of voice to where um they kind of patronize you um and i feel like they were all kind of like different and it was in a random order so it wasn't like a cycle um but like I feel like none of them actually remembering this. I don't think any of them said that they were sorry that they couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, they were just like, okay, we're gonna pass you off to Dr. So-and-so. They weren't like, hey, I'm sorry that we couldn't figure it out. Um, hopefully this doctor will see something else. Like they didn't say that. They're like, okay, next doctor, here we go. Um, I feel like I didn't see, I think that this was probably because like I was like a kid, um, but they were mostly talking to my parents um, and occasionally, like, they would talk to me and ask what was going on, and that's, like, another thing that I think that doctors um, may need to work on just a little bit is, like, if a kid is sick, maybe you should ask, like, the kid what's going on, because sometimes the parents might not understand what the kid is trying to tell them, and so I think that, like, all of these doctors were different in their kind of, like, attitude towards me. Some of them were, like, nice and hopeful, and then I never see them again, some of them were like, okay, like, come on, you're making this up. Like, you're fine. Like, go home, you're fine. Um, and some of them were like, no, we're in Colorado. You might need to drink more water. And like, growing up in Colorado, we know that. <laughs> and so um, 
it was just like all different. Um, there wasn't any clear pattern. And yeah, I didn't really have a favorite doctor besides Hamilton. Um, I think I liked her so much because she was my last doctor. Um, and I can't really remember the other ones. I just remember her. So she's like, I feel like the most important one. She's the one who helped me and saved my life. So let's focus on your diagnosis. What information did your, your 31st doctor, I'm sorry, your 51st doctor use to come to the conclusion that you may have Lyme disease and run that test? Um, I feel like she kind of looked over everything that everyone else had done before and said, okay, what are we like missing here? And so she kind of like flipped through and looked at all of like the tests and was like, huh, you know, your copper is off. Like that's, that's kind of strange. Like, did we do anything for that? And then like, I don't know, the answer might've been no. And she's like, okay, well, let's like figure that part out. And so I feel like she kind of looked at kind of like the big picture saying like, okay, we found out what it's not. Let's find out what we've been missing and like what the test results have kind of like shown us. And let's kind of like put them all together to where I feel like with the past doctors, they were like, I'm going to do a copper test on you. And if something is, um, and if it's fine, then I'm done. And that's it. To where she was like, okay, let's just take a step back, look at everything and see what these results are telling us to see if we can kind of piece together what might be going on. And so I think that like her like imagination for that um, was really impactful since she wasn't like, okay, I'm going to do this test on you and then I'm going to pass you off. She was like, okay, let's kind of look at it. Let's get like a whole summary of what we've been going through and then let's see like what we actually need. So Holiday, so, let's talk, I'm sorry, Matt. Uh, so Holiday, let's talk about how, how the diagnosis is now changing everything for you, right? You now have a child who's been sick, 18 months, 51 doctors, you finally have a diagnosis. How has that changed your parenting experience? Well, first of all, I mean, I was relieved that we finally, you know, got a diagnosis and we weren't crazy, which I knew we weren't crazy the whole time, but it was kind of nice to know we weren't crazy um, and that our kid really was sick. Um, I remember, uh, I remember when we got the diagnosis that afternoon, I actually physically went over to the school and went and told uh, the head of the lower school, this is what's going on. I told the nurse, I told the teachers and they're like, oh, okay. And at the time, since this doctor wasn't a Lyme doctor, you know, she said, you're gonna go on 28 days, Olivia's gonna go on 28 days of doxycycline and, and should be good. And I was like, wow, that's it? Like how exciting. And, and I remember not knowing how to spell Lyme disease correctly and, and just the relief that we had finally a diagnosis. Um, and I will tell you, uh, we started Olivia on doxycycline and about five days after she started it, the kid who had been missing for 18 months came back. Um, she had a twinkle in her eye that we hadn't seen in 18 months. She was funny. You know, she didn't have a sense of humor for 18 months. She was a little sassy, which means you knew she was feeling a tad bit better. Um, she wanted to go out and play soccer. And, and so I was like, wow, this is amazing that we're just going on 28 days of an antibiotic and she's great. And so we did the 28 days. We told all of our friends and family. Everyone was like, oh, that's great. You know, and then um, after the 28 days of doxycycline were over, the kid that we'd been missing, who was there about five days after that was gone again. Um, I mean, she was super gone. And I, that is when I realized, okay, I need to do some research and I've got to find a doctor who um, is, is treating Lyme and, and, well, at the time it's just Lyme. I didn't know she had any other tick-borne diseases, but I needed to find a doctor um, that could help. And so I started doing my research and I started calling all these Lyme doctors all over the country. And, you know, they all had waiting lists of three or four or five years. Um, and I'm like, we, we can't wait that long. Um, and so it happened that a friend of mine, um, her son had a friend who had Lyme disease and uh, West Nile virus and was being treated by a doctor in Boulder. And so I called this doctor in Boulder to see if we could get Olivia in. They had a two-year waiting list. 
Um, but he ended up calling me back the next day and said, since she was so young and had been diagnosed so quickly, which I'm like 18 months is not quick. Um, that he wanted to see her because maybe he thought he could eradicate the Lyme from her body, which now hindsight looking back, that's physically impossible and is not correct. But at the time, you know, not knowing anything, um, that's what we did. So we went up and saw this doctor in Boulder um, for I think about two, two and a half years. And, you know, he did start getting her feeling better, but I always was like, she was always at about 60%. I felt like she could never get over the hump. Um, and he did diagnose her with Bartonella and Babesia too, um, but she just was never getting better. And I, I was doing crazy research on everything. And, um, you know, there was this DAP zone that was out. I was like, could we get her on this? He was like, no. I was like, what about IVIG? Should we get her on that? No. Um, you know, I asked about some other Lyme doctors on either coast and he wasn't really big on it. And I just, in, again, in my gut, I knew that I had to get her to another doctor. Um, that could help her because she just, she was, she was better than she was, but she was at about 60%. And I just thought she can't live like this the rest of her life. Um, and so that kind of started our journey to her next line doctor. So Libby, let's go to your, your first doctor that prescribed you your treatment plan with the 20 days of doxycycline. What do you remember about that time? Do you remember feeling a little bit better before you declined again, like your mom said? Um, yeah, I remember like feeling almost back to normal, like, I don't know, like, honestly, it kind of reminded me of like the claimed effects of what Gatorade would do to you, where like in the ads, it was like, oh, yes, Gatorade will make you like so much more energetic. Um, and so like, it felt like I was like, getting back to normal, like I was like, oh, you know, I have like a little pep in my step now. Um, hopefully things are going to be better. Um, and that was like, I think my first time ever taking like pills constantly. I'm like, had I known that that would be the start of like me taking pills every single day for the rest of my life, I would have been like mortified. But yeah, I felt great. And you know, then I declined again and it was just back to the same old routine. So now your, your next doctor that you went to, what was that treatment plan like for you compared to the first treatment of the 20 days of doxycycline that got you to your 60% of um, your recovery? Um, it was slow. I remember that. And um, I felt like getting slowly getting better. And then it just kind of flatlined where I was like, okay, I'm kind of in this like meh stage to where like I'm functioning, but I'm not really thriving. And I also remember that the medicine tasted awful. It was like these liquid drop things that were the worst. Um, but yeah, I just felt like I couldn't really get past um, feeling fine. Like, and so I wanted to feel great, not just okay. And I feel like I couldn't do that for a while. So Olivia, what was different about this Lyme specialist in Boulder compared to your, your primary care physician or this or whatever doctor it was that initially diagnosed and treated you with the 20, 28 days of doxycycline? Um, well, he was a Lyme literate doctor and she was not. She had kind of done a shot in the dark where he um, knew more about Lyme disease. Um, and I feel like the difference um, was that like, he could get me to like a certain percentage of feeling better that would be constant instead of just kind of ups and downs. Um, and he did have like hope that he would like eradicate the Lyme from my body. And then I think after a year or two, um, he sat me and my mom down and said, Hey, listen, like, I, I can't do that. I'm sorry. Um, um, and I think that like at that point, we were like, okay, it's, I think it's time to find a new Lyme specialist. So Holiday, let's talk about pivoting to the new Lyme doctor. What made you leave the doctor in Boulder and pivot over to another doctor? Because it seems like you went from the regular general Dr. Carousel to now on the Lyme Dr. Carousel. So talk about uh, why you're moving to another Lyme doctor. Um, I, 
I just decided it was time to move. I was asking um, if Olivia should be doing new treatments and stuff like this. And, and the Lyme doctor was pretty set in his way. And I just thought I needed somebody who's doing more kind of um, at the front, new research, new drugs, stuff like that. So I had, I had been doing my research on um, Lyme literate medical doctors and the doctor that kept on coming up was Dr. Richard Horowitz. And um, so I called and asked if we could be put on a wait list and it was an 11 year wait list. And so I figured by the time Olivia was graduating from high school, she could finally see him. Um, and so I realized that was not gonna work and I needed to um, figure out how I would get her to another Lyme litter medical doctor. Um, we were still seeing this guy in Boulder, um, and I didn't want to lose that until we moved on. Um, and uh, Dr. Horowitz is out of Hyde Park, New York, and I was in the grocery store one day, and up came uh, a number saying Hyde Park, New York. So I immediately was like, oh my gosh, I think this is, you know, that's the only person I know in Hyde Park, New York, is Dr. Horowitz's office and it was it was his um, office manager named Janet and she said that um, some of his patients had heard about Olivia because Olivia at this point had started a Facebook uh, page called Olivia and Lime that was a community page and she was doing like Lime challenges eating Lime stuff with um, like our governor and our senators and some celebrities and stuff like that. And that Dr. Horowitz had um, heard about Olivia and was coming to Denver um, for a conference and wanted to meet Olivia. Um, and would, would that be possible? And of course, my reaction was like, yes, you know, of course, let us know. And we'd love to have him meet Olivia. Um, so she said, great, she'll let us know when he's coming in town, she'll call us back and get us tickets to this conference. And we're like, okay. And um, at the end of the thing, I'm hanging up and I said, does Dr. Horowitz have a ride from the airport to the conference? And Janet said to me, wouldn't you like to know? And I was like, oops, I have overstepped my bound and I shouldn't have said anything. And now we're gonna be on the wait list for like 30 years. And I said, well, uh, if he needs a ride, I'm more than happy to give him one. And she was like, I bet you would. And then she hung up the phone and I called my husband and I told him what I did. And he was like, oh, you didn't. And I said, yes, I did. I'm really sorry. And I thought, well, I, I I shot my shot, it didn't go so well, and that was it. And so a couple days later, I think I'm back running errands, up comes Hyde Park again, and I was like, please don't say anything that you're going to regret. And Janet, it was Janet again, and Janet said, well, Dr. H said you can give him a ride. And I literally, like, I think I had to pull over because I was so shocked. And you could tell Janet was not happy about this idea. And um, she said, I will, I will email you his flight information, but how is he going to know what car and where you are? And I said, I, I will have a sign that says Dr. Horowitz. I told her my car, my license plate, and I get off the phone and I like start screaming because I thought, this is it. This is my one chance with Dr. Horowitz because we're like on a wait list for 11 years and I called my husband and my husband said go get your car cleaned right now and he said also he goes and when you pick him up drive him directly to the conference do not kidnap him and drive him around Denver and I was like okay I will not do that so um it was Friday he was flying in on a Friday so I knew what he looked like. Clearly he didn't know what I looked like. And so I had the car clean. I had, I made a little sign that said, Dr. Horowitz. I go, there he is. 
Um, and I literally said it felt like I was getting like a celebrity of the Lime World. Like I was seeing like Bon Jovi or like the Beatles or Elvis, you know, was coming into my car. I was so nervous. Meanwhile, I had gone around before this and gotten all of Olivia's, um, all of Olivia's, uh, all of her records. And I had it in the back seat because I thought this is my one shot. This is it. And so I pick him up. He's very nice. I think he's a little cautious because here's this crazy mom picking him up. So we start talking and he's just delightful. It's a Friday afternoon in Denver. I'm like, great, we're gonna hit massive traffic. I can talk to him for hours. And um, there was no traffic. And I was like, oh God. And so we drove, he was very nice. And he said, so I hear you have a daughter who's sick. Do you want to tell me about her? And so I, I did. Um, and I was like, oh, I've got all of her records. And he was like, keep your hands on the, you know, your hands on the steering wheel. You know, I, don't show me those records right now. And I was like, okay. And so um, he was very nice. And he was asking all these questions like, well, have you done this test? Have you done this? Have you done this? And I'm like, no, I haven't. Meanwhile, I'm driving. So I can't write anything down that he's saying. Um, and he was just very lovely, very compassionate. You could tell he was very smart. Um, and so we got to the hotel and the whole time I'm like, how can I get more time with him? How can I get more time with him? And I'm thinking, oh, I just wish he would like ask if I want to have dinner with him. And I'm like, he probably is meeting with all these people. And so I pull up to the hotel. I thank him very much, you know, for taking the time to just talk to me. And he goes, I don't have any plans tonight. Would you like to have dinner? And I He's like, I'm going to go check in and go upstairs and, and I'll meet down in the restaurant. And I literally called my husband and I was like, I, he could barely understand what I was saying. And I was like, I'm having dinner with Dr. Horowitz. I do not know when I'm going to be home. This is so exciting. And so we ended up having dinner. He looked at all of Olivia's charts through dinner, which I could not believe. Um, I took crazy notes, like the euphoria going through my body was like unbelievable that I have someone who I felt like understood what Olivia was going through, what she needed and stuff. Um, and so then he, uh, you know, he, he thanked me good day that I left and I have to tell you that night, I don't think I slept at all. I mean, my mind was just racing of all this stuff. When we were leaving, he said to me, he said, listen, um, you know, I would love to see Olivia, but I have a wait list. And, and I said, I know. And if you notice, I never asked you if you could see her um, because I know you have a wait list and I know, you know, that is important to you. And he said, um, but let me call my wife and see if she would allow me to come in on a Sunday and I could see Olivia on a Sunday. And then um, you could go into the office and get blood work done. And that way I'm not taking away anyone's spot. And I said, whatever, any Sunday you ever want to see Olivia, we will go and see Olivia. And so um, the next day was the conference to where Dr. Horowitz uh, was going to meet Olivia and um, Dr. Horowitz beeline straight for us and beeline straight for Olivia and was like, oh my gosh, Olivia is so nice to meet you. You know, thank you so much for all you're doing. Um, do you, he had a book that he had signed for her and he asked her, do you have any questions you wanna ask me about Lyme disease? And her question that she, she asked, literally my husband and I like could not believe um, that she asked it out of all the questions. And she said, uh, will I give this to my babies when I have babies? And I thought, what an unbelievable question from an 11 year old, um, that that is what she's worried about is giving her disease to her unborn children. And Dr. Horowitz said to her, he got down right on her level and looked her shade in the eye. And he said, if you're going to become one of my patients, you will not give it to one of your babies. I will make sure of that. And you could almost just see this relief in Olivia's shoulders, like go down. And I couldn't believe that uh, of everything, this is what she was so concerned about. Um, and then he says to her, do you want to come speak at the conference? I'm, I'm going to stop. Okay. Right. Okay. So 
at first he was like, do you want to come watch the conference? And of course I was like, yes, absolutely. And so we go in, there's about 200, 300 doctors and scientists and people that I absolutely don't know. And we sit at like the little front row and I'm just like this tiny little kid. Um, and so he gets up to speak, but right before he gets up, he goes, Olivia, you're going to be speaking after me. He didn't tell me that at all. He, he just said that like right then and there. And it was my first time speaking for Lyme disease besides like going to my class to do that. So he gets up and he speaks and I have like this tiny little notepad and I'm like trying to jot down like bullet points. And as like an 11 year old child, I'm like, oh my God, I might pass out. Like, I don't know what's going on. And so he goes, and my newest acquaintance, Olivia. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And so I get up, I give my story in front of all of these people that I don't know. And this is my first time ever publicly speaking about Lyme disease to people that I don't know. And um, that kind of literally like kicked off like this new train, this new cycle of me like speaking for like my, a living. Like I, it was incredible and it was also terrifying. Um, but yeah, that was the first time that I ever spoke in front of people for Lyme disease. And it was very unplanned, very unprofessional. Um, I only had like 10 minutes to write down everything that I needed. And, and then do you want to continue after that? Well, let's, let's, but let's stay with this for a second. So you, you said that, you know, this, this was a transformational experience that you found something special about yourself that you didn't know until you had this Lyme journey and you were invited by someone who saw that in you and invited you to now become a public speaker. Yeah, and it was so new to me and how I like told myself my three year or how many years ago? I think three, maybe five. I'm not sure, but had I told myself back then from my future self, had I said, yes, this will be the first time of your many times of speaking in front of people, um, I probably wouldn't have believed them. I thought that this might've been like a one-time thing, like the highlight of my Lyme disease journey. It, yeah, that was the very first time. And I was so nervous and I was so inexperienced too. And now like looking back from where I am now, and in that like short amount of time and like at a young age where like we do like speeches in class and like a lot of kids get nervous and I still get nervous. Um, and looking back and saying, wow, the first time I ever spoke was in front of 300 scientists and doctors. And I only had 10 minutes to prepare for the doctor that I didn't even barely know. And I really hoped that I was going to become his patient like it was just so like spontaneous and it was incredible. So we talk about the pain of Lyme disease, but there is, there is beauty as well. And although, although this was a terrible experience for you to have as a child, um, it put you in a position where you were able to identify your God given gifts at 11 years old, which is a really beautiful really beautiful part of your story and we're going to spend some more time talking about that um, as uh, as we as we finish talking about this treatment journey uh, but uh, it, that was uh, and, and and let me talk to you holiday about this I mean how powerful was it for you to see this 11 year old child identify her gifts um I I mean we my husband and I when she spoke we were blown away because I kept telling me like Olivia should you be writing like what do you and she's like I got it I got it she kept on going I got it and I'm like I didn't get it <laughs> oh yes you did but I literally was like okay but there's all these scientists and doctors are you sure you got it she's like I got it and and she nailed it and hit it out of the park and even Horowitz knew she nailed it and hit it out of the park this is what she was created to do yeah and, uh, and, and, you know, I don't think looking back that we knew the journey that she was about ready to embark on. Um, but I think for us, I felt like I could finally breathe as a mom, that I felt like I finally found a doctor who was going to take care of Olivia. And that if anything happened to me, I knew she was in good hands. 
to where I didn't have to be leading the march anymore, that he was going to take care of her, make sure she was okay and take care of her, you know, the rest of her life. And, and, you know, if he retires and whatnot, you know, we have a whole contingency plan of where she's going. So truthfully, I felt like peace that I, I had finally gotten her to where she needed to be um, for her diseases. But, uh, but I'm, I, so I'm, I'm at the cl cliffhanger here. I mean, did, did we go from the doctor in Boulder to Dr. Horowitz or was it someone else? I still don't know. <laughs> so, so, so hilarious. I mean, the story is so funny. So, so Dr. Horowitz gets done speaking and, you know, he's kind of a celebrity. And so all of these people are swarming him. And um, I knew he had to catch a flight because he was going on to another conference. So I said, the driver, so you have it. I <laughs> said to my husband, I said, I said, and he's kind of a tall guy. And I was like, you need to go in this like swarming of Dr. Horowitz and say, Dr. Horowitz, you got to catch a flight. And a holiday wants to know, do you want to ride back to the airport? <laughs> and so, so he did. And sure enough, you see my husband, he's like the bouncer getting Dr. Horowitz and we're getting back in the car. And I was like, yeah, I was so excited. We're taking him back. And so um, he's sitting in the front seat. My husband's driving. Olivia and I are in the back seat. And so um, Olivia, out of nowhere, goes, hey, Dr. Horowitz. So um, I'm going to start a nonprofit about Lyme disease and I'm going to have a gala and I am literally looking at her like, what? What? and uh, I'm going to have a gala and I was wondering if you could be the keynote speaker at our gala. And I, I literally am like kicking her on, on the, I'm like, what? what are you doing? And he was like, oh, sure, Olivia. And he pulls out his calendar on his phone. He's like, Okay, so it looks like April 6th, I could do it. Does that work for you? And she's like, works for me, great. I, I, I literally am like, what, what? We're having a gala? And, and, what? and so literally he gets out of the car, we wait by, he said he'll be in touch. And he, we get in the car and I, I, I look at Olivia, I go, we, we have a keynote speaker to a gala we do not have. And she was like, well, Looks like we got to do a gala. <laughs> well, let me do that all the time. Like the one yes. thing I've learned about with Matt, I can't tell you how many things we've done that I didn't know we were doing. That's sort of <laughs> a, one, of, one of the things that happens with the with the, with the Lyme community. So, but wait a minute, Holiday, I still don't know. Okay. Is Arwitz her doctor or not? I need to know. You're killing me. So, so Janet called back and Janet was like, so I heard you took Dr. Horowitz back to the airport too. And I was like, Yes, I did, Janet. <laughs> so Janet was like, well, Dr. Horowitz talked to his wife, Lee, and Lee has agreed that on Sunday, December 3rd, um, he can see you. And I said, we will be there. You let us know where, what we're doing it. And um, so that was, we saw Horowitz in October in Denver. And so it was December that we flew uh, to Albany and then drove to Hyde Park. And Olivia was actually really sick again. Um, she had gotten really sick. So it was a perfect time for us to be going because he got to see her not feeling good. And so he said to us, um, be prepared. These, um, these appointments go really long. So like bring some snacks. And I was like, snacks, I'm not bringing snacks. Like that's ridiculous. Well, needless to say, we were starving. Uh, it was a six hour appointment, six hours. And he had us bring in all of Olivia's medical records. So we had, you know, stacks and stacks and he started and he started reading through each page. And I literally turned to my husband, I go, oh my God, we are gonna be here for a very long time. And we were, and um, I think, I think uh, back to the 50 doctors, 51 doctors before, um, he would be reading and he'd be like, oh no, they didn't. And I, I would say, what? And he went and hit his head against the wall. And he said, um, look at this, um, they called the pediatrician uh, from the hospital to say that they thought that um, 
the mom was making it up to get attention and that the daughter wasn't sick. And so he said, um, as he's hitting his head on the wall and he's like a, he's a doctor. And so like a doctor, like cartoonishly hitting his head against like the wall, that's like something that you don't really see. He goes, yeah, they thought that you guys had, I haven't pulled up because I can't pronounce it, um, Munchausen syndrome, which is where you fake illness. It's a syndrome where you like make up illness. And he goes, I can't believe it. After all of these tests and results, you think that they'd find it sooner. And they had in, so he showed me this and in this report, and they said they thought it was Munchausen syndrome and that to release the mom and daughter because we were making it up. And I said, what doctor said this? Um, I was livid. Um, and, and I had hot splotches on my chest. My husband was like, I think you should go take a walk around the block. So I did, I went outside and I went and walked around the block and I like screamed, I was so angry. And I know who this doctor is. Um, and I said to my husband and Olivia and Dr. Horowitz, and I was like, if you ever see me punch someone in the face, it is this doctor. And so I have yet to see this doctor, but if I do, I, I will, I just, I could not believe it was even in a report, even if you felt that way to like type it out. Um, so Holly, as your, uh, as your internet lawyer, I just want to advise you, <laughs> you shouldn't be letting people know about the premeditation of your punching of <laughs> your doctor. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so uh, let's, um, let's, now talk about this Horowitz experience, right? So um, you know, one of the things I do want to compliment you on is being our second Horowitz stalker. We, uh, we actually had a podcast episode with this wonderful woman from Canada named Joanna Petrakis. And we named her episode uh, the, the Canadian Stalker because how she ultimately was treated by Dr. Horowitz was that she just kept going to conference after conference after conference and just getting in his face so that he would ultimately take her as a patient. And that seems to be the tool we need to use with uh, Horowitz. Stalk Horowitz, drive him to events, and ultimately he becomes your doctor. So I'm sure Matt is gonna to wanna to talk with Olivia about this experience. Yes. Matt, let me, let me hand off Olivia to you. Yeah, so Olivia, what was it like from your standpoint as, as the patient being really sick like you were, as your mom said, when you went to upstate New York, walk us through the six hour doctor's visit with Dr. Horowitz. Um. You know, it was almost like therapy in some way and also like reliving my past because all of those doctor, uh, all of those like medical records were in order. And so I'm like listening as he like goes through and as he makes comments about these and signs off on these and hits his head about this thing. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I, I remember that like, and so it kind of like brought back memories that I didn't know that I had about it. Um, and it was like very like clarifying to know that like he was like okay here's what the real plan will be like it was such an amazing change of pace instead of being like I don't know to okay here's what we got to do um and so at first I was also like skeptical because I'm like ah well I don't want to get my hopes up because last doctor like haven't really been you know that helpful to like helping me like cure my illness um, but he definitely was, I mean, he had like, I don't know, some, I, I don't even know, some kind of like aura or something to where it was like the, I can do it attitude. And that was different from everybody else that I saw. And so it was just incredible. Um, and it was like also incredible to think that like, wow, I lived through all of these as he's like going through like this long or more, I think of like medical records. Um, and like flipping through them individually. Um, and so, yeah, it was just like a time of reflection, a six hour long reflection um, on what I had been through and uh, where I was hopefully going. So at the end of this, this appointment, this six hour appointment that you didn't bring snacks to, what was your, um, what was your takeaway with Dr. Horowitz? What was your treatment plan going to be now that you're seeing the famous Dr. Horowitz? Um, I was like, you know, I may have a shot of like having a normal life again. Like that seems to be like the odds are starting to weigh in my favor. Um, and I felt, I felt hope again. 
and it, it was nice. It was nice leaving from that to our tiny little motel in Hyde Park and thinking, wow, like, I could be normal again. That's crazy. I didn't think that that would ever happen. So what was the actual treatment that he prescribed uh, after you left that appointment with him? Um, I think that he wanted, he did do blood draws. Uh, he wanted some more tests done and some like retesting of certain things. And he was like starting to diagnose me with other things. Um, Cause his whole thing was, I want to know what you have first instead of finding it out later, which by the way, with his diagnosis things, he found out um, that I had co-infections like really quickly too. Um, I was already diagnosed with Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia, but he also found out just from like, I think one sitting um, that I had POT syndrome, relapsing fever, and anti-1 trypsone deficiency in my liver. Um, and he was like, yeah, like I, I can tell just by looking at you. Like, these are what you have. Like, and then he was also like, here, you can answer, like go through these, like I think 16 questions and your answers determine what you have. And I've like been doing study on this and it's really accurate. And so like we did that and I was like, oh man, like he really knows his stuff. Like this is great to have a doctor that like kind of knows what's going on more. And it's like more confident in his answers and more determined than everyone else that I saw. And he did lots of, so we went in on, then on that Monday to get blood work done because obviously he wanted to see what co-infections and, you know, where everything was. And in full disclosure, I did bring Janet a present to say thank you. Um, or did you say sorry? <laughs> exactly. exactly. No, I think she was like, oh God, here she comes. Um, but uh, we did go in and do blood tests. And then um, once the blood test came back and all the tests that he wanted to do come back, then um, we got a plan together for Olivia. And that's when all of her, um, he had her on about 64 pills a day. Um, and so he had her on a couple different antibiotics, uh, anti-malaria pill, and then tons of different supplements. Um, and that, that's what started, uh, Olivia with Horowitz, of uh, doing that. And then what's great about Horowitz is, uh, you know, he then, um, you know, uh, we would do telehealth medicine since we were in Colorado with him and, um, he would always be tweaking, you know, he's kind of this mad scientist of always tweaking her medication if it wasn't working. And so, uh, we would definitely tweak her medication on a regular basis and switch out antibiotics and, and do different things. Um, uh, her mold was really high. Uh, so we had, you know, a mold expert come through our house and found like the tiniest bit of mold in our bathroom, but it was, you know, just destroying Olivia. Um, so, so I think with Olivia and my husband and I, when we left Hyde Park, New York, um, you know, we've all had a sense of hope and a sense, you know, we had, we now had a plan in action, which we'd never had before, um, of what we were going to do and how we were going to help get Olivia, um, better. And so it definitely, we left Hyde Park, New York, just so happy, relieved, and just feeling very blessed that, um, that we had Olivia to Horowitz. So it sounds like a, I'm sorry, sorry Rich. <laughs> Holiday, so let's, let's stay focused on this plan because I think this is a really important part of this story. Is Dr. Horowitz the only person that gave you a long-term plan so that you understood where you were going or a map where you understood where you're going and no one else ever did that before? Uh, I think Dr. Horowitz's plan, Olivia's first Lyme doctor did have a plan, but it was very hodgepodgey and kind of, it just wasn't good. Um, Dr. Horowitz has, uh, a, a, well, his plan is to get Olivia well. His plan is to make sure she is a functioning person. So that is his main objective. Um, and so then we're always just tweaking it. I mean, we've been tweaking it now uh, for four years. She's been seeing him and, and we're still tweaking it. But he, he's the kind of doctor that you want who listens because your symptoms can change. Things can happen. Um, you know, you get older. She's gotten older. So what's happening with her body weight, you know, to where compared to when she was 12. So um, 
so, and he's always on the forefront of sort of what's happening, what's going on. And, you know, he was an internist before he came, became a Lyme doctor. So he also looks at the whole body anyways, which is what you want. So yes, do, do we have a plan for Olivia? Her, our plan is, you know, to have her be well enough to go to college um, and none of us worrying about her. But um, do, so that's our, our main goal is to get her, you know, to as healthy as we can. And Horowitz is always tweaking it to, to get her there. And, and, you know, we watch her blood, we watch what she's eating, we watch everything, you know, her blood was a mess a couple months ago. And so Horowitz is like, we got to fix this, we got to fix this. So, you know, I feel like it's always, always changing. So Olivia, what was this like from your standpoint? Now you're on 60 something pills a day and you're finally seeing a doctor who, who really understands you and is going to be able to help you. Talk to us about the experience of what it was like to take these pills and the gains that you were achieving through them. Um, I remember the first time that I was on the pill regimen and um, it was 86 pills a day. Um, I threw them all up the first time. Um, it just overwhelmed me completely and it was really awful. And so um, I started to like get used to it slowly. It would take probably like 10, 15 minutes for me to like get them all down. Um, and I remember I had like little grouping systems for them. Uh, so if it was like, I think like two of the same pill and they would go together and like, I would like even everything out. And I remember also that I had, I would like set a record for myself of how many pills I could swallow in one, one time. Uh, you know, just, what, just what was the record? Uh, the record was eight. Um, but if it's like the little circular pills, I can do 12. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just kind of like made it more fun for myself, I guess. Uh, I always took the pills with Lime LaCroix. And at one point, um, I think I ruined my taste for LaCroix because every time now I have a Lime LaCroix, I think about taking all of those pills and there's some like attachment to it. So like, I don't, I don't drink that anymore. Um, I'm kind of sick of it now. And so I was taking all these pills and it was definitely a lot more than before. It was like the most I've ever had, but I was also like, okay, well, there's like a, there's a chance that like I could be normal while I do this. So like, I got to keep pushing through it. And so that's what I did. And it was really gross. I mean, the taste of pills is like always in my mouth now and it's the worst. And um, yeah, and but I got through it and now I'm on one or two pills a day and it's worth it. So Olivia, let's, let's talk about the, the, the gains that you made physically. So how are you, give us an idea of where you were when you first started treating with Dr. Horowitz and what your limitations were and what you were able to gradually be able to do as you treated with Dr. Horowitz. Um, I was able to, so in the beginning, um, I had lost my ability to run um, because like almost like as if I had asthma, I just couldn't run, um, I felt lightheaded. Uh, I felt like my lungs were closing in on me. Like I thought that I was going to lose my vision um, because like the edges of my vision would go black. Um, and so I also still had the tremor in my right hand. And so that was at the beginning of when I um, started treatment with Dr. Horowitz and gradually over time, um, I was able to like run more and not as much as I used to before. I still haven't played soccer or lacrosse, but I've been doing volleyball since you do short sprints, um, agility, um, you kind of just stay in place or um, you don't really run as much. And so I like found a love for that too. And also the tremor in my right hand is gone. Um, and brain fog. yeah, and brain frog, frog fog. Um, I still have that sometimes, but it's not as bad as before. And um, I would also say that like my energy has gotten better a lot. And also with pot syndrome, um, in the beginning, uh, my hand would be, would be like ice cold to where like my friends would like not let me hug them. Like they were that cold. 
um, they felt like a, like a corpse's hand. Um, that's what they told me. And um, after like having treatment with Dr. Horowitz and like continuing, continuingly, um, like my hands have been getting better. Um, so as a kid, I would like do this, like I would crunch my fingers together and like hold them like this. And so just as a habit, I still do that um, just to make sure that like I'm not getting cold again. And so you can see me doing that. And then I also hold my right wrist. So I don't have a tremor anymore, but that's also like a habit from the past that I still have, um, especially when I'm nervous, I do that. And so I feel like some of these things aren't completely gone, but they've gotten so much better to where like, I'm happy with the results either way. Um, and so I really do think that it's been working wonders for my health. And at some point with Dr. Horowitz, I know you mentioned earlier, you had, you had mentioned um, looking at Dapsone. And now with Dr. Horowitz, I think you're looking at Dapsone again for treating with him. Is that correct? Yes. So I think, was it two years ago? So Three? two summers ago, Olivia did the Dapsone protocol with Dr. Horowitz. She was his youngest patient to do it and youngest body weight. Um, so we didn't do the full double because we couldn't because of her body weight and her age. Um, but, uh, we did it over the summer, not to mess with her school. And we did it actually, uh, at the Lake of the Ozarks and, um, she tolerated it fairly well. We've heard that some adults have a hard time with it. Um, kids supposedly have a better time with it. Um, and uh, it was the first time in six years after her Dapson treatment that Olivia was antibiotic free. Um, she had been on antibiotics for six years and um, she has been antibiotic free now for two years since the double Dapson. Um, we just had our meeting, our telehealth meeting with Dr. Horowitz a couple weeks ago. And because now um, Olivia's at an adult body weight, um, he wants to hit her with it one more time. Um, we have to get her iron is still pretty low. So we have to get her iron up and then he's gonna hit her with a double dap zone, uh, I think in January and it's eight weeks. Um, and he just published a paper in the antibiotic journal on the double dap zone treatment to where he had 45% of his persistent Lyme patients uh, feel that their Lyme went into remission after doing this. And so he really feels that the DAP zone is the closest thing as of right now we're going to get to uh, putting um, patients' uh, Lyme into remission. Now, that's just for Lyme. It's not including the other, you know, tick-borne diseases, which is also a problem. So you still have to treat those. So, so definitely, you know, people ask, I've had many moms reach out to me about should they put their child on Dapsone or not? And out of all the antibiotics and all the drug treatments and everything we've been on, um, this has been the most effective for Olivia. Olivia, from your standpoint, many people that we've talked to have been on the Dapsone protocol and said it's been horrible and they've been really, really physically ill as a result of being on the protocol, but it has helped them in the long term. It sounds like because of your age that maybe you didn't experience those same effects. So can you talk to us about what it was like from your standpoint physically and the side effects of taking Dapsone over that summer that you took it two years ago? Um, so I think that like I did have some side effects, but they weren't as bad as like what I had heard. Um, I think that like my energy had just gotten lower and like I had more muscle aches and things like that. And I was like tired all the time. Um, and I think that like, I definitely had like a feeling of like being burned out a lot. Um, I'd say that one of the, in my opinion, one of the strangest side effects is that like, it will turn your urine green, like bright neon green. And so that was like pretty strange. Um, <laughs> And, but yeah, I handled it really well. And I think we did it for a month, two months, maybe. Um, since we wanted to like, uh, we didn't want to go like straight for the full dosage. We wanted to kind of like ramp it up. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hope that I'll handle it um, the same way if I do it again um, next summer. Um, I hope that like, I won't have any worse side effects than I had before. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that like, because of my age and my body weight, um, I didn't have as bad of side effects as I had heard before. If you had to assess your health now, I mean, you, you, we've been on this interview now for a few hours and you've just been 
performing very well. Clearly you don't have any more, um, I almost called it brain frog again, brain fog. Um, how, how would you assess your health? What, what percentage would you say you are recovered from your initial Lyme disease and co-infections? I'd say it ranges from 89 to 92. So I'm very high up there. I am not completely well, but this is the best that I've ever been so far. Um, and even if like I couldn't get better, which I really hope I can get better eventually, but even if I couldn't and if I had to stay at this forever, I would be content in doing so. Um, as my school would say in any other American school system, uh, this is a passing grade. So yeah. <laughs> And what treatments are you currently on still today to maintain your health? So she's still on uh, medication for her POTS, Midadrine. Uh, she's still on for that. She still takes supplements. Um, her iron's low. Her blood's a little wonky. Um, she was doing IVIGs, and she might need to go back on that. Um, but, uh, that's really, uh, it for right now. Um, we're waiting. She just had some blood work done to see where everything's at. And then we're going to figure out the DAP zone, what we're going to do with that. So we've, we've really learned a lot about, um, your journey and a lot about Lyme disease that we didn't know before, even though we've interviewed 150 different people. <laughs> and one of the things that I find really exciting, Olivia, that you just taught me is that the reason Dapsone is working so well is because you get to pee the lime out of you, it turns green. So <laughs> we, uh, we have learned so much, as I said, and I, I, I don't mean to be goofy, but it's a thought that came to me, so I figured I would share that with you. So let's talk about this journey of transformation that you began to share with us, that your family has gone through and has allowed you to cr contribute so much to the, uh, to the Lyme community. So you're 11 years old, Dr. Harwoods invites you to come up and speak. He obviously sees something in you despite your young age, and he invites you to come up and speak. And that has sort of begun this journey that you've gone on now as a family where you've done nothing but contribute to this community. And I have to tell you that one of the things I find most moving about this interview with the two of you is that you were treated so poorly by so many people. 50 doctors failed you, neighbors are not believing you, doctors are accusing you of of, um, of abusing your child by virtue of uh, making up illnesses, but you had both so really happy and wonderful people. Um, and, uh, you know, even though I was teasing you a little bit, Holiday, about not punching your doctor, I can tell you I would have punched him if it had been me. So you'll, you are certainly much more reserved than I am. Talk to us about, despite all of this pain that you went through uh, and, and, and so much failure, what inspired you to do so many of the things you're going to do and have done um, for the Lyme community? Talk to us about that um, holiday first. What, what, what inspired you to give back so much? Well, it wasn't me. It was Olivia. So this was all Olivia's idea. Um, I had uh, helped out with different nonprofits, helped do galas for different nonprofits, um, all as a volunteer. And um, I was at my last gala. Um, I had decided I was going to retire. I was burned out um, and I didn't want to do anything else. And um, not a single one of the volunteers came to help set place settings for 500 people. So I was doing it by myself and my husband brought over the kids and dinner for me. And Olivia was helping me play set. Um, and this was May of 2016. And she said, you know, you, you do so much for so many others in Denver, you know, what if we did something for the Lyme community? And I was like, well, what do you have in mind? And she said, I'd like to start a foundation. And I already know the name of it. I want to name it Live Lyme. And I, cause we, her nickname's Liv. And she goes, my nickname's Liv and I'm living with Lyme. And I, I look at her and I'm like, uh, that is very impressive. You know, that would take a, a big ad agency, a lot of money and a lot of months to come with, up with that. And I said, you know, let's table this. Let's talk about it this summer at the lake. Um, let's, let's talk about it because you, you can't do a foundation. You can't half-ass it. You have to do it correct. But let's also do the research and see, you know, if there's other foundations out there that are doing what you want to do. And maybe we just go and help them out. So we tabled it. Um, Olivia kept on sort of bugging me about it. And we talked about it over the summer. And she said, you know, listen, 
I really want to help kids. Uh, and then I really also want to help science because I want to get well. Um, and so we did our research and um, Olivia decided this was something that she really wanted to do. And so um, I'll let Olivia tell why. So, so let's, let's talk about that, Olivia. So we have the we have the Live Lyme Foundation, right? We learned very early on in this podcast interview that you are not going to allow this to stop you from living. Your name is Olivia. You are living with Lyme. So we have this sort of this, uh, this triple play uh, on the name of this wonderful foundation that you've created. And you've done a lot of things with this foundation and you've seen a lot of people and it's been a wild journey. So let's talk about um, what you saw in your mother working with other foundations. Of course, she was supposed to do that because she was supposed to model this for you. And now that you've learned from your mom modeling by giving back to the foundational community, you've decided you want to take all those lessons and start a foundation for Lyme. So talk about that. So the whole reason why I wanted to start a foundation in the first place was because um, I was like, I think I was on Facebook and I'm looking up stories of other people um, with Lyme disease. Um, Cause I was just curious. I was like, does everybody like experience exactly what I experience, or is it like different? And um, I found out that it was so different. Um, but the process of diagnosis is very similar, but everybody's different, which I think that that's also something that we like need to change. Um, Cause you have to look at every human as a different person. Um, and I remember coming across this one story of a mom and her son, and they were living in their car so they could afford the boys Lyme disease medication. Um, and out of all the stories that I had read for that day, that one just like stuck with me. And I thought about it later and I was like, wow, people have it like way worse. And I was like, I'm just kind of like sitting here and doing nothing. And like these people are out there just like suffering so much worse and they can't like get the treatment that they need and they can't like do all these things. And I was like, well, I just can't sit around and do nothing anymore. Like I gotta go do something if no one else is. Um, and I think that because of how badly I was treated like by um, classmates and by like doctors, that also encouraged me more. Cause I was like, yeah, I do not want people to go through like the same thing of having like other people not believe in you and give up on you that is just awful and so yeah I went to my mom and I was like okay I know that you want to like retire from doing galas um but I have an idea for a foundation I want to call it the live Lime foundation um because I'm live, I'm living with Lyme, and my two reasons are I want to help children afford their Lyme disease medication, and I also want to help give funding to researchers and scientists so we can find better treatments and cures for tick-borne diseases. Um, what do you think? And um, so we thought about it, and all of a sudden, in January of 2017, it came to life. And then we had the foundation and so far we have given 31 grants to kids from 49. What? Yeah. 49. I, sorry, my bad. <laughs> brain fog, that's okay. Yeah, brain brain fog. I'm sorry. Um 49 grants to kids from all over the US. And Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and we've had over 800 applications from the US, Australia, and Canada. And so like a future goal that I have is to like do international too. Um, but right now we can only do kids in the US. Um, and we have given four grants to top scientists at um, Stanford, um, University of New Haven and John Hopkins University. Um, and we are hoping to give one to uh, Dr. Lewis at Northeastern University soon. Um, and this foundation really just kind of kicked off all of a sudden um so our plan was uh we were going to do the research of okay well if there's another foundation out there that's already doing what we want to do then let's just like donate to that foundation um we did the research and there's foundations doing things for kids and there's foundations doing things for scientists but there's no one who does both and also in the Lyme world, there's a little bit of a East Coast, West Coast kind of, a, I don't want to call it a war, but like a disagreement where you're on the East Coast side or the West Coast side of the foundations 
and we're just a little little Colorado foundation right in the middle um and I I also think that um that helped too um and actually what Dr. Horowitz had told us um, when we talked to him about starting a foundation he was like here's what you have to do you got to keep your head down and just do the work don't get caught up in politics or any drama and so that's what we've been doing and it's been great for us and um I also think that maybe because I'm a kid, I can open up more doors than maybe adults can. Um, because I feel like having a kid speak maybe is more like um, you can sympathize with them more, um, almost, um, to where you don't often see a kid speak. And in a room full of adults, there's like this little girl in a little dress who has like her little paper up and she's like, okay. <laughs> Here we go. Um, and so I feel like I've been able to open up more doors with that. Um, and it's just been an amazing experience so far. I've met so many new people, so many incredible people. And I'm like just in awe of what we've well, So let's talk about some of those people you've met. There aren't many 16 year old uh, people who have met governors and presidents of uh, foreign countries and senators. So talk to us about uh, what it was like to meet, uh, for example, the former president of Mexico. Um, so we met him at my grandmother's house and she was hosting a party and he was there with his wife and he was very laid back and relaxed and very just like a friendly person. Um, and like, I was like, wow, I can't believe this is happening. It kind of felt almost like a fever dream. <laughs> I gotta admit, I was like, yeah, I feel like I'm gonna wake up from this at any moment and it's all going to be gone. Um, but yeah, he was incredible. Um, so you met President Fox, right? And uh, you also met uh, Senator Collins. What was that like to meet with Senator Collins? She's certainly one of the stars in the, in the Lyme community. Um, so in the Lyme community, we really try not to go for anything political. So if there's any senator, governor, um, representatives out there um, who are talking about Lyme disease, we just go to them. Um, we do not care who finds a cure. We do not care anything about that, nor do ticks. They don't discriminate. They bite whoever. Um, and so that's how we are. We do not like care about where you're from, who you are. We just want to care because we have the same goals. And so I think um, we were with uh, the CDC and the NIH and we were like having dinner or something like cocktails down at like the lobby of a hotel. And all of a sudden um, my mom's phone, phone um, it rings and uh, it's one of Susan Collins um, secretaries and um, she says, hey, um, uh, Senator um, Collins wants to uh, see you guys right now. And so we're like, all right, she wants to see us. All right, here we go. And so we go over and we go see her. And she's like, okay, I have this thing called the Tick Act and I want you to help us pass it. And so we were almost like recruited by her and that was such like a crazy thing and I never thought that, that would happen at all. Um, and she was really nice about it and um, yeah, it was just amazing. I did not expect that to happen at all. I did not expect a phone call like that either. So um, let's talk about some of the other uh, stars in the Lyme community. For example, uh, you met uh, before he passed Dr. Spector. What was that like? He's incredible. Um, he was, he lost his heart to Lyme disease and he still kept fighting. He was already doing so much for so many different communities. I mean, he was a cancer scientist who developed medicine. Um, and once he lost his heart to Lyme disease, like he kept going. I feel like if I lost my heart to Lyme disease, I would be like, all right, I may have to like tap out like that is a pretty traumatic experience but yeah he kept going and he kept on doing so many things um and it you know strangely enough it he kind of reminds me of um bruce banner from the marvel cinematic universe who is like 
such a smart person, but also such a force to be reckoned with. Um, and so he was like a superhero in his own nature. And it's really sad that we lost him this year. So in addition to all the advocacy work you're doing, both uh, in the governmental arena and in the entertainment arena um, and raising money and making um, grants to folks, you're also doing some other work. Uh, why don't you talk to us about first your uh, Tick Tracker app? So this was about three years ago, back at the Lake of the Ozarks. Um, and we had just let our dog outside and um, he came back inside and he was like itching and scratching and biting himself a lot. And we had found out, um, we had like looked in his fur and we saw all these brown little specks and they kind of looked like freckles and they were tiny. Um, and so we um, looked closer. I got this little tick kit thing that uh, I made for a, a fifth grade science project that had like tick tweezers in it and stuff. And you would carry it around while you're um, hiking. And so I got little tweezers and magnifying glass out. I pulled one off and I'm like, oh, would you look at that? It's a lone star tick. And he is covered in them on all four legs up to his chest. And so we are absolutely freaking out from the past events that we've had with ticks. Um, and we had just let like 200 of them into our house. And so we are like freaking out. It's like 11 o'clock at night. My mom is driving to like Walmart to go get like dog shampoo, like tick shampoo to get it off. Um, and so as we're in the midst of this kind of crisis, um, I asked my mom before she left, I'm like, hey, what if there is a way to see what ticks are in your area in like real time? And she's like, okay, not right now. No, we're gonna figure this out. And then we're gonna figure that out, okay? And so the next day I'm like, okay, okay. So what if like you could see ticks like in your location and what kind of ticks? Like almost like Snapchat, almost where you can like see your friends where they are in like real time. And uh, she was like, huh, okay, well, let's do the research. If there's a website or an app that can do that, uh, let's not do it then. And so we did the research, no website, no app. It was just CDC reports from like two years ago. And they didn't even show like migration of like the month or the year. And so we got in contact with some app developers who knew my great uncle and they're in Ohio. And so we had a meeting with them. And then boom, eight months later, uh, Tick Tracker was created and it's a free global app in multiple languages that lets you see what ticks are in your area in real time using geolocation. And I feel like in the first like week of us putting it out there, we had over like 5,000 people download it and use it. And um, it took off as well. And it took off to the point where um, we spoke at the DC, um, at DC um, in the um, White House. And um, this was for the HHS uh, TOP project, which uh, stands for the Opportunity Project. Um, and Tick Tracker won. And uh, we were the only nonprofit there and we beat out Oracle and IBM. And then we later, I think the next day, spoke at the US Census Bureau about it. Um, and we've been speaking with the Gates Foundation. Uh, Microsoft wants to help us develop an AI for it to where you can take a photo of the tick and it'll tell you what kind it is. And it's just been a whole other like evolving project on its own. And I didn't think that like that little idea would kind of sprout into something so like incredible. And that, that is incredible. So much of what you're doing is incredible and you're, you're really an incredible young woman. But I'm gonna talk about one more thing and then we're gonna talk about the future. Um, talk about your tick emojis. Uh, that was a really cool thing that uh, we came across when we were researching uh, in anticipation of this. Uh, it seems like you got a lot of attention with your tick emojis. So, um, when was this? This was in DC and uh, 
we have a really good friend who also sits on the board for the Live Lime Foundation. And um, her name is Colonel Nicole Malkowski. Uh, and she was medically retired for having Lyme disease. And she was the first female Thunderbird pilot. And she's just such a badass. I, I, I'm sorry, um, excuse my French, but she is just so incredible. She also reminds me of a superhero. And um, she was like, you know what would be so cool is if like Apple had like emojis for ticks since they have emojis for like mosquitoes and like bugs and spiders. But like, what if like they had like a little tick emoji? And so we were like, huh, you know, maybe we could do something about that. And um, so we, um, with the same app developers, uh, they started creating tick emojis and then we sent them off to the CDC for them to kind of like verify to make sure that they were all accurate. Um, and they were very nitpicky about certain things. They were like, um, the hairs on the legs need to be more prominent or like something like that. And we're like, oh, they're, not, they're kind of like a little tiny on the phone screen, but okay. Um, and so I want to give full credit to this idea to uh, retired Colonel Nicole Malakowski because this was her idea. Um, and so, yeah, and now you can download the tick emojis and use them and you can, they're like little stickers where you can like also put them on like messages, like past messages too. Um, I think they're pretty cool. I think that Apple should actually down, like create a tick emoji that people can use. Um, but yeah. There you go. There, there's our tick emoji story. <laughs> that is a cool story. So uh, what else is going on with the foundation? Not that there could be anything else, but uh, is there anything else that we haven't talked about that you're working on? And talk to us about what you think the future is for your foundation. Uh, well, as you know, with COVID, um, everything's kind of had to be like put to a halt. Um, we were on such a roll with Lyme disease. I mean, we had just gotten this act passed. Like we were traveling so much to where I think we were like burning ourselves out. Um, and all of a sudden COVID struck and now we're home and we're like, wow, how could we have like traveled from DC to New York and like speak all those days and like, had that energy. Um, and so hopefully with the future, um, COVID will uh, not be as big of a problem. Uh, and hopefully we can kind of get back on that train of like making a difference and um, bringing it to the awareness of like government officials and getting more acts passed and getting more funding for scientists and like getting more research done since I feel like we are like 40 years behind on the research. Um, and so I feel like definitely need to get those things started up again. And let's talk about you, Olivia. What what is what is in the future for you? Your mom was always dreaming about her children graduating from high school and going to college and being productive members of the society. And you are very very productive, even though you're only sixteen. So where do you where do you see yourself going to college? And what is your um, your vision for your uh, life professionally? Um, you know, I hope that again with COVID and everything. Um, I can like have a normal college career. I hope to go to like Stanford, USC, Duke, um, big schools like that. I think that, like those schools are just so amazing. And also there are Lyme scientists there. So I could like continue work with that. Um, as for what I'm going to do in the future, I don't know. I've had a lot of people throw ideas at me. I've even had people like, strongly suggest that I do these things to the point where it's kind of weird. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I have people who want me to become scientists and doctors and senators. I have people who want me to become FBI agents. Um, and so hopefully um, I'll make a right choice about that. One that I feel comfortable in. I definitely know that I'm going to continue on the foundation. And so, yeah. I will see what the future awaits me. All right, so my final question is going to be to mom. So, Holiday, um, you've had a really difficult experience parenting, unfortunately, because your daughter came in contact with a really small um, bug. And um, I want to ask you now, if, God forbid, you got a call from a friend who had a young child who had just been bitten by a tick, what would you recommend that she do with her child so that she and her child would not have to go on the journey that you, well, at least the difficult part of your journey, there's certainly many beautiful parts of this journey, but at least the difficult parts of the journey that you and your family have had to go on. 
Um, so I actually answer this question almost weekly um, from parents who call freaking out um, that they found a tick on their kid or there's a bullseye rash or they just came back from camp with it. So um, we get this phone call on a regular basis and I, I feel like I have to talk a lot of um, parents, you know, off a ledge. They're freaking out because they don't want to have what happened to Olivia happen to their child. So what I say is, first of all, which I think you did too, is keep your tick. Um, it would never occur to me that you could do that, but now you can keep your tick and have it tested, which I think is very helpful. Um, my second thing I say is immediately call your pediatrician and ask if they will prophylactically put your child on 28 days of doxycycline. 36 would be better. Um, and that if uh, your doctor will only go and get you like 10 days, seems to be the new thing that they're doing is 10 days of doxycycline, which really doesn't do a whole lot. I tell them to go and go um, to urgent cares and start hopping around to where you can at least get about 35 days of doxycycline. And then I say, you know, watch your child's symptoms. Um, keep very vigilant on it. And then if you need more help, um, you know, the Live Lyme Foundation on our website, we have a list of all the Lyme literate medical doctors that um, our grant uh, recipients and then also our grant application uh, kids are seeing throughout the United States. Um, and to go find a Lyme literate doctor to help you. So that's my whole thing is you need to be proactive um, and really watch your child and see what happens. So I wish somebody, now for Olivia's case, we didn't see a bullseye rash and we didn't have a tick. Um, and it was just an unfortunate situation. But I think um, what I always say to parents and even adults is when you have somebody who's sick, especially a kid, they don't want to be sick. Kids don't want to be sick. Kids want to be out with their friends. They want to be on their sports team. They want to be doing stuff. So believe in your kid, believe in your kids, um, what they're going through and look at what they're going through and then believe in yourself and keep on fighting until you get the answers you want. Thank you for listening to the Tick Boot Camp interview with our guests, Olivia and Holiday Goodrum. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Olivia and Holiday Goodrum and their tick disease journey, please visit their Instagram pages at Liveline Foundation or Tick Tracker. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Boot Camp podcast, please share it with your friends by using the social media buttons you see at the bottom of the post. Third, Tick Boot Camp has created a Tick by Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been provided to us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at www.tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. Please note we would appreciate any input or improvements you would like to offer. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get you automatic episode updates of our Tick Boot Camp podcast. And finally, please take a minute to leave us an honest review and rating on iTunes or our website. Thank you, as always, for your attention and for listening.